to welcome tonight's wonderful guest and awesome book, we have Arlene Montesano. Arlene was born in New York City and has been a resident of Santa Barbara since 1992. She has been involved in fashion for most of her life and in 1990, Arlene and her ex-husband started Lucky Brand Dungarees. They have two daughters, a son and three granddaughters with another on the way, congratulations. Aside from fashion ventures, she's a partner in many successful restaurants, including Lucky's SB, Tre Lune, D'Angelo's, and Joe's Cafe. She also remodels homes for rental properties in Santa Barbara and New York. Along with her husband, Scott Westbrook, please welcome Arlene Monasano. Welcome, everyone. I'm here to introduce Tammy Leitner. She's a 12-time Emmy award-winning broadcast and print investigative journalist. She has worked as a network correspondent, reporting on the Today Show, Nightly News, and MSNBC. Before that, she was an investigative reporter in New York City, Chicago, and Phoenix. Her investigations have taken her across the world. She was awarded a George Foster Peabody and an Edward R. Murrow for her international investigation into a U.S. government cover-up that revealed American soldiers had been forced to bury Agent Orange on a South Korean military base, leading to illnesses and deaths in countless innocent victims. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. did you feel compelled to write this story out of all the stories you've covered in your 25 year career? You know, as a journalist, I've covered literally probably thousands of stories in my career. And typically, I choose the stories that I'm going to cover. But this story quite literally chose me. Mm. Well, you started this book 20 years ago, and you wrote more than 100 pages but then you stopped writing the book. Why is that? There was something missing. I couldn't figure out what it was at the time. I, I've written, oh my God, 100 pages. I had all the police reports. I'd done a ton of investigating, but the story just, it didn't feel like it was going in the right direction. So now, 25, 20 years later, when you decided to finish the book. So what was it that made you decide? Like, what was that missing piece? The missing piece was I decided that I needed to tell the stories of the survivors. And that was how I started to dive back into it. But as I started interviewing these women, because I decided it was going to be about them, I started sharing my own personal journey of my own trauma and they got me to open up a lot and talk about my experiences and that was how this book became more than just a true crime book. It became part memoir. So I have a question about the predator because he was at large for what, 20 some odd years? A little bit more than that, almost right. 30. Across all of these different states. Right. And how do they get away with these things? Like, why is it so difficult <clears throat> to catch them? Yes. Back then, I think it was a lot easier to get away with this type of crime. Because think about it, he started in the 1970s. And back then, police agencies in different cities didn't necessarily talk to each other. Um, let alone police agencies in different states. They just really didn't communicate and they didn't have the capabilities to share information. As you'll see if, when you read this book, how many of you guys have read this book? Because I don't want to give too much away. Yeah. Oh, a lot of you guys have read this here. Yay, okay. Um, as you remember reading, you know, they had this guy in custody multiple times and yet mm. he walked free. And, you know, a couple times it was because of flaws in law enforcement. And would that happen today? I hope not. Mm -hmm. I think we've come a long way. Yeah, I agree. 
Well, you initially set out to identify if there were other women who had been assaulted by this predator. What did you find? I did find that there was, well, so before I, before I say that, this guy, he admitted victimizing 3,000 people. And when I say victimizing, I mean breaking into homes, robbing people, stealing identities. Detectives believe that he sexually assaulted more than 100 women. But not all of those women have been identified. And so I set out to at least identify the women that I could. I found one woman, one woman living in Southern California and she didn't want to be found, which, you know, understandable. it's understandable. She wasn't ready to talk about it and that's her prerogative, but she had never been linked to his crimes. Um, I truly believe in all the detectives believe that there are many other women out there. This guy lived in states and traveled all across the US. He worked as a long haul trucker for many years. And so he'd been across the United States multiple times. And so it's unclear how many other women could be scattered across the US that were victimized by him. Well, you became quite close to one of the survivors. It was Karen Sullivan from New York originally. Mm -hmm. Um, and you maintained a 20 year relationship with her, a friendship. Yeah. Are you still in touch with her? Yeah, we are still very close. And has, how has she survived? Like, is she functioning? Does she, you know, I've read about some of these women that had nightmares and have never, their life has changed. It will never be the same again. And some were like still an addict and, mm -hmm. you know, they've gone to drugs and things. So how, how did Karen survive all of this? You know, it's interesting. She lost everything after the sexual assault. She lost her home because she could no longer live there. She had to move out because she couldn't go back there. She lost her boyfriend eventually. She had been in a long-term relationship and he just didn't get what she was going through as it happens to a lot of women who have been sexually assaulted. Um, she eventually lost, left her job because she couldn't deal with it. And so she really, she lost herself also. And eventually she went from victim to survivor to advocate. And she advocated for other sexual assault survivors. And during the 80s, she really became <coughs> the face of sexual assault survivors in Phoenix. She fought to change the way law enforcement treated <coughs> victims of crimes, especially sexual assault crimes. And she changed the training that law enforcement went to, went through. And so she really, she changed the way things happened in Arizona. And is she still continuing to you know, I, I think she did this for about 15 years. She received the governor's award and a, a number of other awards. And I mean, you know, she's in her, she's 70 now. Wow. Yeah, so I mean, she was very outspoken when it came time to do interviews and you know, she still cares tremendously, yeah. but. I am I mean, I really give her credit for taking charge because most women don't want to even admit or, you know, tell anyone about rape and it's just, it's an awful thing to live through. And I mean, I, I don't know, I, I just, some of the stories from some of these survivors are just amazing. I know there was also an 11 year old child and mm. you know, they're just monsters. That's, you know, Arlene, that's one of the reasons that a lot of these women eventually decided to speak to me for this book. They decided to speak because they wanted other women who have been assaulted to feel empowered. They wanted them to have a voice, and they told me, each one of them, you know, they had their own reasons, but it was to the extent of, if I can help one woman find her voice, if I can help one woman not feel shame, if I can help one woman feel empowered, then it's worth revisiting the worst day of my life and telling my mm. story. Mm. Well, I mean, you hear about these serial, you know, serial killers, but the 
like serial rapists. They don't, they don't make the headlines usually. They do a little blip in the newspaper, and they, it's, the stories don't come out as if someone was murdered. And I feel like that needs to change because why is sexual assault like hidden? You know, it's it's definitely it's a societal thing. I mean, you're right. We don't, you know, oftentimes when we talk about rape, you know, oh, she was she was raped. You know, mm. it's the way we discuss it in society. It's it's shameful, and that needs to change. Which is one of the reasons that I wrote this book. You know, nobody who was sexually assaulted should ever feel shame. They, it was done to them. And even the way that the media reports on it, this woman was raped. No, she wasn't raped. A man raped her. So it needs to change the mentality, the way it's talked about. We still have a long way to go as a society in dealing with it. Yes, uh, there was a victim in the book that, you know, she was raped in broad daylight in an alley. And she's, you know, bound and, you know, he finally takes off and she's like running around the streets, you know, naked and nobody's helping her. Yeah. And it's just an awful situation to, for that to have happened. And people are just passing by and they don't, they don't want to get involved. They don't help, yeah. which is outrageous. Yeah, it was, you know, that was a number of years ago, but it is one of those, you know, turn a blind eye. This was a, this was a tough, a tough thing to report, not only because of my own experiences with trauma, but I mean, asking these women to revisit such a traumatic time. And as I mentioned, I mean, there was really, we all had the same mentality. We want this to be a book of empowerment. We want other women and men who read this book to feel empowered. We want something positive to come from this. We all had that same goal. And I hope that when you read that, you feel the strength that these women have from going through this experience. So where did the title from the book come from? He used to say that to them. He used to say to each one of them, some version of don't say a thing. And the other place that it came from, um, for 20 years, I didn't say a thing. I kept silent. My family didn't know what I was going through in my own traumatic relationship, toxic relationship. My friends didn't know what I was going through. And so I will <clears throat> never keep quiet again. And I hope that anybody else that is in any type of abusive or toxic relationship, I hope that they find their voice as well. Well, you've included your own personal story in this book. I mean, was that difficult to you to all of your experiences? Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it only took 20 years. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, I never set out to write about my, my life, um, and I probably never would have if it had not been for these women sharing their story. Because you had a very traumatic experience with your ex-husband. I did. And what he put you through. Yeah. Who's also known as the monster because my monster. Yeah, your own personal monster. Yeah, where is he now? As far as I know, he's still in Arizona. I don't talk to him. I mean, that would not be healthy. But yeah. Hmm. Did that change your views about men in the long run? I'm the first person to ask that. <laughs> it's an interesting question. Um, I don't know how it couldn't to some extent. I think for a while it probably did. It probably scared and scarred me. But as time passed, I learned to trust men again. And I learned that there are still good men out here in this world. <laughs> And I'm grateful to have met a lot of them and to have learned to trust men again. Hmm. Um, in the book, you talk about how you didn't tell anyone, friends or family, what was going in, you know, with your relationship. How did you stay silent for so long? Shame. I had so much shame. I, everything, I felt like it was my fault and I thought this was normal and I think a lot of other people who are probably in 
unhealthy relationships, whatever that looks like, they stay quiet. And that's one of the big reasons I decided to write this. Because I don't want anybody to stay quiet. I don't want anybody to go through what I went through. And so my hope is that just one person finds their voice and decides to talk to somebody and doesn't wait 20 years to do so, which is what I did. Yeah. And you were kind of blindsided by what he was doing and you had oh, yeah. no idea. Even though you're living with somebody and you're married to that person for 10 years almost and to have, and he had so many secrets. Yeah, I mean, that was, you know, I was, I think that was one of the, probably the reasons that I, I wanted so desperately to find answers from this serial rapist and why I interviewed him in prison. Um, because he, he lived a double life. He was married to two women. He had kids. And my husband lived a double life. And so there were so many parallels and I knew that I would never get the answers that I needed from the man that I was with. He would never tell me the truth of why he did it. And so in some strange way, I thought that if I got the answers from this serial rapist, why he did these things, maybe it would help me understand human nature and why people do things, which I don't know if that makes sense, but at the time, I think that's why I was searching for answers from him. Yeah. and. I know you, you talk about shame in the book and the mm -hmm. toxic shame and it kept you stuck in that relationship mm -hmm. for years, but what advice would you give others? Talk to somebody, talk to one person, find a friend, find a therapist, find a priest, whoever it is, <laughs> just talk to somebody because most likely you are going to discover you are not alone. Somebody else out there is going through the same thing you're going through. Did you find parallels between Rob and the rapist? I'll let the reader make their <laughs> own decision on that one. <laughs> well, I thought it was a fascinating book, and um, there's so many questions I want to ask, but I don't, I don't want to give the book away. <laughs> We're open to questions. If anybody has any questions about the book, you know, it would be interesting, Arlene, to see. How many people in this room know somebody that was raped? Because it is a silent crime. I'm guessing a lot of people I'm in this room do. I'm, I know I do. She does. In some way or form. Hands are coming. <coughs> All right. Yeah. A lot of in the back here. Yeah. Another one. Almost everybody. Yeah. See, Almost everybody. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. 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 A lot more common than most people think, and mm -hmm. a lot of people don't talk about it, right. which is part of the problem. Well, it's embarrassing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They blame themselves, usually. Well, in the old days, sorry, Greg, is he still here? <laughs> <laughs> the cops were different, oh, yeah. and, and I'm, a, I'm a cop lover, so I'm not putting them <laughs> down, uh, even you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, was, uh, I was physically abused for quite a few years. And when I finally did get a sheriff, because I was in the county, <coughs> a sheriff to come to my door, and he saw, I mean, I was a wreck. Well, could you tell me what you might have done to deserve this? I could not believe what I heard. But I have to say that it has changed. A, a woman that is abused sexually or physically now really is a victim and they're noted as a victim but not if they don't say anything <coughs> I'm so sorry you went through that but I think you're right I think things are changing and have changed and hopefully they'll continue to change thank you for sharing you're welcome I have a question about your dad I, I, I'm not, I haven't finished the book, but um, you, you mentioned that you're, the part that I'm at, you mentioned your dad was suspicious that he had a, fat, a feeling. And I think as parents of adult children and stuff, you sometimes have a feeling you don't know. I mean, uh, so I'll be interested to find out how that plays out, but that you're, everybody lo you know, loved him, but then your dad saw a, something else. And I think that, that instincts we have 
we need to pay attention to. And I referring to Rob. <laughs> yeah, my dad and I talk about that a lot. We have, and he, you know, I always say to him, "Why didn't you just tell me you had this feeling about him?" And he says, "Because I, I didn't want you to have to choose between him and I. Mm -hmm. I know that I would have lost that choice back mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. You were in love with him. He was mm -hmm. your first love." What was it like working with all those detectives? I mean, that was really tough. They were great. I mean, honestly. You were privy to a lot of information. Yeah, but it took time. And I mean, back then I was a newspaper reporter. And as a newspaper reporter, like, you had time to work your beat, work your sources, you know, work the story. Um, but I mean, I've kept in touch with them for, I mean, 20 plus years. Yeah. Yeah. Two of them have passed away, but three of them are still alive. They actually went to my book event in Phoenix. Oh. And I mean, probably the most rewarding thing was hearing from each one of them that they learned something in the book that they didn't know about the investigation. Oh, so that so means that I did my job yes. right. Yeah. 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 We were very, very thorough. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Where are we today with the criminal justice system and kind of making this more of a crime? Because it seems that's not, I mean, it's, it's just... It seems like it's there yet, but I mean, it's got, it's like you all said, it's getting better. Do you have a better sense of where it is compared to 10 years ago? I mean, we've come farther because, I mean, if you look back, so the crimes that he committed in the 70s in California, um, late 70s, in California, he never, uh, he never was charged with those. Mm -hmm. If he ever finishes out his sentence in... Florida and then finishes his sentence in Arizona where he'll be extradited then he would be extradited to California to go um, to go on trial for it there but the way the law works is you're only you only the statute of you only face charges for what the crime was back then mm -hmm. so he would only face like eight years mm -hmm. oh, for Jesus. sexual assault wow. for back then so now you face a lot more time yeah. than what it was back yeah. then so we've come farther yeah. but I mean still it's not like murder right yeah yeah some that hand chopping stuff I think that was <laughs> well he will be chemically castrated yeah. If he ever is released, I mean, but Florida is one of the few states that does that. Wow. Not all of them do. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's a really yeah. good idea. Florida is one oh, of the few. I, I built that one across the states. Across the world. Yeah, do you have a question? Um, no, I just wanted to make a statement. One thing you haven't mentioned that is incredibly important is um, since 1989, the use of DNA, mm -hmm. and which is, you know, a million times reason for women to go uh, go see a friend or something but I swear I would go straight to the police the police and present you know have the evidence collected so that yeah, if straight someone to the hospital. yeah mm -hmm. go well you go to the police and then they take you to the hospital and the evidence is collected and then they can they can um, you know incriminate mm -hmm. the person and if they don't catch that person if the next person if the next person who's assaulted does the same thing, and then when the person is finally caught, they can have a record of like, you know, 50 DNA samples. You are absolutely right. Yeah. And that's I mean, that is, that's since 1989 is when they started using yeah. that. That's part of the reason that I've been advocating in each state that I've gone to where I know that he passed through that they have all of these rape kits right. untested sitting on the shelves. Mm -hmm. And I've gone and I've said, you need to mm -hmm. test these against him so at least these women will know if they get a hit that their rapist is behind bars. Right, yeah. and just, just to encourage women to report, right. that, you know, they aren't just reporting and having it go nowhere. Mm -hmm. There is like valid, you know, irrefutable evidence. Mm -hmm. And so they could, you know, they could find the rapist. It yeah. wouldn't be like a you know, horrible experience that led to nothing. Very yeah. good point, yeah. 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 Um, I'm wondering if in your journey you encountered Amanda Wynn, who's been working to change policy around keeping rape kits. She is a rape survivor who discovered that she had to pay to have them like extend how long her rape kit would last and fill out applications. And she's been trying to 
change the laws state by state. She sounds like somebody I'd like to meet. Yeah, <laughs> she was nominated yeah. for a uh, Nobel Prize at one point. She's a young woman. And it was, there is a documentary about, I was just shocked hmm. by the destruction of rape kits mm -hmm. and the inability to get access to yours. And it just depends on where you live and what the laws are. Mm -hmm. Well, so. she definitely sounds like somebody yeah. that's doing some good. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yes. Um, what kind of closure do you have or don't have since the finish of the book? Um, I think that it's a lot better. It's I've come a long way, and the nightmares are gone, and I feel like I'm at a good place. Yeah. Stuart? I have two questions. Um, <laughs> during this entire process, would you learn by yourself? And also, how did you need to be to write this book? What was the last question? How did you need to be to write this book? What did I learn about myself? I learned that I was stronger than I thought I was, and that this affected my family a hell of a lot more than I thought that it did. It, it had a huge trickle-down effect um, for a long time that I didn't acknowledge or really think about as much because I just knew that I was suffering so much and I didn't think about how they were all suffering. Um, and how did I need to be to write this? I needed to, I needed to go back in time and I needed to live it again. And unfortunately that meant dragging my partner, who you all know, or a lot of you know, back there <laughs> with me. Um, and that was probably a pretty tough journey for her for a few years. So mm. thank you, Gabe. <laughs> one more question. One more question. Oh, one more question, anyone? Did you know of any other women that have come forward after the book uh, was released? Or no, is but there a way of tracking that? Not yet, but the one thing that I have heard a dozen times since in the last week and a half, two weeks, is from both men and women. Um, who've shared their stories with me that they have been in relationships that were with somebody that were not what they thought they were. Um, and they thought they were alone. And then they read the book and they were shocked. And so that's, that's very validating because it makes me feel like this can help just one person, knowing that, look, it may not be the extent of the relationship that I was in, but there's so many people out there that are in a relationship with somebody that lies to them, that is toxic, and if they realize that they're not alone, maybe they'll leave, because nobody deserves to be in a relationship where they're not happy, where they're not trusted, where they're not respected, and so that's what's surprising. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you.